Welcome to the Libertarian Counterpoint. I'm Richard Fields. On the program today we have Deva Minima, who is a uh, city councilman since uh, November of 2016 in the great city of Dixon. Welcome to the show. Thank also you. John Cameron, the uh, author of uh, uh, Rewire, Rekill, and the soon-to-be-published Aristocracy, Aristocracy, uh, it, which is the third in the trilogy, if I'm yes, not mistaken. Yes, it should be uh, in time for Christmas presents. Also, uh, Development okay. Officer at Pacific Legal Foundation. Welcome to the show. Thank you, Richard. Uh, the uh, first topic I want to get into tonight, well, first of all, I should say that uh, we're on the air uh, on uh, Channel 17 in Sacramento, on YouTube, on uh, the, the web at www.accesssacramento.org. Uh, write that down so you don't forget it. And uh, we'll uh, uh, also be uh, on various other cable channels around the, around the, uh, around the country. First topic I want to get into tonight, Devin, is um, something to do that you, something you've been working on as a city councilman mm -hmm. in in Dixon. It seems like you've got the city owns some undeveloped property, and there is controversy on what to do with it. Absolutely. Well, and one of the main things about this property, we all uh, in Dixon call it the party market site because that was the grocery store that was there long, long ago. Um, it's actually located uh, literally at First and Main or uh, A in Maine, so um, it, so it's... So prime, prime downtown location? Absolutely, the prime, prime est of locations. Um, and for my entire lifetime, it's been an undeveloped gravel lot. Uh, up until... Is it being used for parking? Just about eight years ago, they finally opened it up for parking. Um, but the city council, and what, what I've noticed throughout my entire lifetime is that uh, the councils go through these phases where they, they get uh, an idea in their head um, and there's some movement towards that and then eventually a minor detail will end up killing the project. And I've come to see it as, as uh, essentially a tragedy of the commons that as long as everyone has a say in what can go there, a minor project or a minor detail is enough to derail the entire project. and. Um, Lately, we've been going through yet another iteration. Instead of having a private developer come in where the city council wants to have it be a park, or I should say the rest of the council wants to have it be a park, where I, was, I would much rather see it sold off to a, a private developer who could put something there uh, that the free market could, could agree on. Whereas if you have the city council again going through this process, this is the fourth time now, uh, it's going to get shot down at some point because any community member is going to come in and eventually have it take issue, and that one person will be enough to derail the entire thing. So right now, how many, how many people on the city council? Uh, there's five of us, including the mayor. Okay, and so the other four want to make a city park? Is that what you're telling me? Exactly. exactly. But the problem with that is somebody will want swings, and somebody wants a slide, and somebody else wants a putting green, and, and, they can't, and, and nobody can have exactly what they want. Exactly. I, I, I kid you not, at the last meeting, we actually had a debate. Um, well, I should say the other councilmen had, a, had their own uh, fight over whether or not there should be 21 parking spaces around the edge of the park or 27. And so the, those six parking spaces were almost enough to kill the plan that they had laid out that evening. So I have very little hope for that lot getting developed in the near future. Wouldn't the simplest thing be to do to say, okay, uh, this is a prime piece of real estate. Mm -hmm. Let's sell it to the highest bidder, benefiting taxpayers with uh, lower taxes because of the uh, increased revenue, and uh, sell it to the highest bidder for uh, you know a private use, whatever they want to do. Exactly. Uh, and uh, and then collect a sales tax on whatever it is they want to do from now until eternity. Exactly. What's wrong with that plan? Well, that's that's put, exactly put the bit. plan that I like. So, <laughs> so is that what you're, are you have you proposed that? That that's what I've been advocating, and that's why uh, in all of the um, so far we've had just one vote, but there's going to be a series of votes, uh, basically hammering out the details of this plan that the mayor and and the other councilmen are trying to put forward. And uh, in those votes so far, I've been abstaining because I don't believe that we should be going with this plan over that plan, I disagree with the entire thing. Right. right? I don't think we should be moving forward with it. Now, if these guys, uh, and I've, I've said this before um, on social media and, and even at council meetings, 
if they can get something done with it, congratulations, they'll be the first council in Dixon to be able to actually develop that lot into something. In how many years? 25. And what are, just out of curiosity, what are some of the other proposals that have ended up going nowhere? Uh, one was to have a movie theater. Um, and okay, that would be something that you would just contract it out to somebody, uh, to a private Absolutely. business to do. What was, how could that go wrong? Well, the problem with that was that the city wanted to place zoning regulations. On, in fact, we have a specific zone that is just for the party market site in the center of town. No other place in the community, no other land has that same exact zoning. So because it has been such a political football over the years, there have been special regulations added on uh, where people are, are, are wanting to make sure that this doesn't go in or that this does or that that doesn't, you know. Um, one of the other plans was to and have... Somebody, somebody didn't want a movie theater? Well, they wanted to have a square in front of the movie theater. <laughs> not, a, not a rectangle, it needed to be a square? God forbid. No. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Octagon, it had to be a square. So I, yeah. I, can, I, can I throw some questions out? How big is this plot of land? Uh, it's about, uh, it's a little more than two acres. Okay, so that's, mm. an acre is 244 by 244, so let's say... 500 by 250, that's, that's a good chunk of land. Mm -hmm. So typically what happens with parks, and, and I could be wrong, is they become crime magnets um, and uh, uh, magnets for uh, lawsuits for liability mm -hmm. against um, they, whatever mis municipality maintains it, um, and they don't produce any revenue at all. What about the idea of, um, since this is prime real estate and it would go do you have any idea what it would go for if is something comp, uh, something of that size that's nearest uh, near it? Well, we we've, we've had different estimations over the years. It, it's it's estimated to be around three hundred and fifty to four hundred thousand dollars the way it is because it's completely blank. There's no there's no um, infrastructure to it essentially. So you're telling me that two acres in the middle of town private land would only go for how much? 350 it's probably less than two acres what would you say yeah, about about two acres okay okay yeah, give or All right, take so t two acres uh mm -hmm. what about i'm just throwing out some wild ideas what about the idea that um you use the revenue uh from the sale of that piece of land to buy a larger park that's or a larger piece of or develop a piece of land that's not quite in the center of town not quite prime real estate and, mm -hmm. and buy that and turn that into a park and then have revenue producing uh, land in the middle of the town. Is and, and buy a larger park absolutely. while you're at it. Yeah. yeah. Bigger park, yeah, and you can pay for the park with the sale of the land. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, I, I think that's, that would be, that would be the main reason that we're not having the political will to sell it in the first place is because there are so many people that are attached to that location. They have this idea that they want it to be um, a, a park or a square or whatever in, in the center of town, even though we have a park literally a block and a half down the street that is underutilized and under-maintained. How many, uh, how did the city gain control of the property in the first place? I'm assuming it was, when it was a supermarket, it was privately owned. Right, exactly. It was privately owned. Um, the it, it went into... It, it was a condemned building for a long time and the city used redevelopment agency funds back when we had redevelopment agencies uh, to purchase it back in the 90s and, and so that's how that's how that came about uh, so that's that's federal or state money uh, state money grant money mm -hmm. yeah. and well, you know how grants work right yeah you have uh, you know have a ten thousand dollar pothole uh, repair job <laughs> And so you could, you know, spend ten thousand dollars and do it. But instead of that, you say, well, let's see if we can get a federal or a state grant. Uh, the state comes in and says, well, we can give you a grant, but we're going to have to do it according to state standards. It's going to cost a hundred thousand dollars, <laughs> but we'll give you a ninety-one thousand dollar grant. Exactly. That's the way it works. <laughs> Just, yeah, you probably already know that being on the city council. <laughs> yeah. Well, we've we've seen plenty of cases where that that ends up happening. <laughs> so what? Uh, do you remember what it sold for in the nineties? What the what they paid for with using somebody else's money? You know, honestly, I, I couldn't tell you back then. Um, but yeah, I one of the one of the interesting uh, one of the things to me about it is that it's become such a uh, again a, a political football. People are driven to show up to council meetings about this issue. 
and so it's got it's it's got uh, some emotional uh, heartstrings that it's pulling uh, among the uh, the local citizens. Exactly. Yeah. But the underutilized park, a block and a half away, apparently does not. It's unjustifiable. <laughs> Exactly, well, and of you'll, course you'll have to keep us up to, up to date on what eventually happens to that uh, piece of land. I, I'd be interested in following that uh, story to its uh, uh, not inevitable conclusion. <laughs> yeah. Well, fingers crossed. There, there well, will be a conclusion you're a young eventually. Man, hopefully, you'll live to see it. Something happen to it. Exactly. <laughs> um, another uh, interesting uh, city issue happened in Toronto recently. There was a, a city park, uh, interestingly enough, where. Mm -hmm. Uh, there was a slope, a uh, rocky slope, where people had uh, made a uh, de facto footpath, but the problem was it was too steep and people were uh, falling and twisting their ankles and ha having other kinds of, uh, of accidents. So it became clear that a, a little stair, you know, a simple uh, stairway would be, would be a safety feature and, and make, it a lot, make the whole uh, thing a lot more usable. So uh, the city, in their wisdom, decided to spend, you know, do studies and figured they could build a, a staircase for $65,000. But it was going to take them a while to do plans and studies and probably apply for grant money. I'm not sure mm -hmm. if they have that in Canada. Figure out so a local guy, a local guy thought that sounds like an escalator. I can do it for less. So he hired a homeless guy and spent $550 on materials and labor for the homeless guy to build a perfectly uh, functional staircase. The community's happy, everybody's happy, except for the city council. They don't think it's a very good idea because uh, all of the I's were not dotted and all of the T's were not crossed. Is that the attitude you would have as a city councilman? <laughs> Absolutely not. And this is, this is one of the things that drives me crazy being councilman and taking the approach that I've taken to, to governance is that you have to have faith in your own constituents and in your own people. Otherwise, you're cynical from the output, right? And when I see things like this, it becomes totally apparent to me that staff was advising them, you know, and when you're on city council and you don't come in with a set of principles or a set of beliefs about the, the, the way that you should be governing and the way that you should be influencing policy, that the staff is going to become essentially uh, the, the end all be all. Uh, of how you're going to approach topics. So you're saying right. that the bureaucracy runs uh, runs the show. I'm That's shocked, exactly it. That never happens anywhere else in government, does it? <laughs> yeah. So, hey, go ahead. Uh, well, first of all, let's compare. If this happened in California, uh, the uh, Addy would be a criminal because um, any job over $400 in the state of California legally has to be uh, performed by a, a licensed, a licensed contract. contract. Yeah. Well, so there was a, there was the, a guy he, the guy he hired, criminal, and him hiring him, criminal, uh, in California. Yeah. Apparently in Toronto, uh, that's not the case. Well, we've got some criminals by that definition uh, in, in uh, Santa Cruz County. Because in Santa Cruz County, there's a vigilante pothole gang mm. who are uh, buying yellow, uh, you know, vests, setting up roadblocks and then uh, buying, uh, or not buying, but actually getting uh, cold tar donated, and they're filling in potholes that the county can't seem to find time to get around And they for. haven't put them in prison yet? And they haven't been what arrested for anything. Now, the county's not happy, but they're continuing to fill potholes in, in, in Santa Cruz County. Well, this is, um, the Santa Cruz County is not an isolated incident. This is happening all over the country, and, and where it happens a lot is in, um, Forest Service land, because it you know they have to run a study, they have to put a job out for bid. This offense will will go down. Somebody's cattle or are are running free, you know, and because it borders public land, it'll take them a year and a half and fifty thousand dollars to fix a fence where you know the rancher will go out or the farmer <coughs> will go out and um, take the fence, uh, put the fence up to save his livestock from you know running off. And you know, then they'll go after them criminally for doing something or other. So mm -hmm. there's an awful lot of vigilanteism out there, because the um, the the problem with having the county do any of this stuff is that their their um, stated purpose is to fix the road, but their real purpose is to ma make sure they grease the palms of the people that are going to give them donations to get reelected. Um, this is definitely not an isolated incident. I think it's wonderful um, when you think, what, what would you call people who are vigilantes for good? 
you know, not uh, not stringing people up or not vandalizing or beating people up. They're taking not the law into their own hands, but but improving public safety. Productive vigilantes, I, Productive I guess. Productive vigilantes. Uh, <laughs> pro 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 lantes versus vigilantes. I don't know. I think it's I think it's fantastic. Um, I know I'm I'm probably guilty of fomenting rebellion and crime, but I would love to see this um, pretty much everywhere. Mm -hmm. You know, people are that's that's the this is a prime example that individuals left to their own devices and not uh, relying on government to fix things will find a quick, inexpensive, and many in this case free volunteer labor, volunteer product um, right. to deal with a public safety issue. Most um, adults are f perfectly capable of taking care of themselves. It's the job mm -hmm. of government to let them. Mm. Exactly. I absolutely agree. <laughs> but it's uh, a real job of government to prevent them so they have victims they can take care of and get ever bigger paychecks and bureaucracies. So. Uh, well, <laughs> there you go. Uh, some years ago uh, in South Africa, there was a problem with uh, poachers uh, trapping, killing actually, uh, rhinoceroses. They would kill rhinos for uh, their horns. They'd harvest the horns and sell them for some sort of uh, magic potent patent medicine or something or another. Mm -hmm. But, uh, you know, you could get, uh, you know, many thousands of dollars for a rhino horn. Mm -hmm. And the only way to get the rhino horn for the poachers usually was to kill the rhino, mm. which is kind of uh, uh, a wasteful way of going about it because mm -hmm. rhino horns grow back, and so you can <coughs> actually uh, put the put the rhino to sleep, uh, remove the horn, saw it off or whatever. It grows back, doesn't hurt the rhino at all, and then you have a, you have a uh, a resource that reproduces itself and is uh, is uh, self-sustaining, so to speak. So. Uh, South Africa decided to uh, legalize the domestication, taming, uh, uh, and uh, domestic produ production of rhino horns, make it legal for farmers to own, take care of, and harvest rhino horns. Take care of the rhinoceroses, harvest their horns, sell them on the market, and it was a pretty good business. Uh, you know, the farmers made money, the price of rhino horns went down because there was not the illegality of a black market at work. Uh, but of course, the animal rights, animal welfare rights people found out about it and decided, can't have that, can't have anybody actually using animals for uh, profit, although they probably go to Wendy's or in and out uh, well, maybe not, maybe they're vegetarian, but you can't have people harvesting plants for profit either. Anyway, uh, the, uh, the problem, uh, you know, the, 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 the ado led to the outlawing of rhino farms. Well, guess what? The rhino farms were outlawed, and within seven years, the uh, poaching of rhinoceroses had gone up 9,000%. And this is not an isolated incident. In Africa, there are some right-thinking um, states, governments, that have looked at the horrible problem of poaching and, and decided to allow hunting uh, and of these "Quote unquote endangered species to generate revenue, um, so that uh, they can actually pay people a living wage to protect them. And in every case where this has been done that I'm aware of, that I've researched, um, the uh, quote unquote endangered species have thrived. So, um, and in the U.S., uh, there the deer population is is uh, some people estimated a few years ago is greater in the U.S." Than it was when then before the uh, invasive white people came and Native Americans were here. Why? Because there's there's some revenue generated and there's there's therefore vested interest in keeping this population up. Um, and because the population is up, it's not so scarce, and um, everybody benefits. More deer, more hunters, more happy people, more venison. And same thing and in more think, antlers to hang on the wall. More and really, really the annoy wall. the animal and welfare people. The, the the thing about I think rhino horns are actually almost like hair. I mean, they're very dense and everything, but they do grow back. Yeah. And as you pointed out, it's hard for a rhino corpse to produce that again. So, something that worked uh, because the um, because uh, private enterprise was involved in it is banned and there's a, a horrible, there's loss of revenue, the, the, the rhino herds are decimated. Um, and I think, uh, being the cynic that I am, um, I always look, I follow the money. And so who benefits if, um, 
if rhinos, uh, if those horns aren't harvested, it's the people who are uh, making fortunes in the illegal rhino trade. Who are probably donating money to the animal welfare groups to put pictures of rhinos on their uh, uh, quest for donations to keep without the whole scam their, going. Without their little horns. Yeah, yeah. right. How cruel that is. Uh, you sound like you might be as cynical as I am, Richard. Uh, I, I will uh, match my cynicism against your cynicism, cynicism when it comes to uh, <laughs> governance any day of the week. Well, that's the kind of the, I would draw a parallel to uh, dr drugs being illegal in this country. When you look at... Uh, the fact that the CIA was uh, probably uh, uh, the biggest drug trafficker around back, back in the day. Well, certainly drug user, because yeah. of the crazy stuff they come up with. <laughs> but no, I, I agree. I mean, you, you have to follow the money, and, and the money is huge in anything that's illegal and, and missing in anything that's legal. The more highly regulated, the more um, high, the larger the criminal offense or the civil penalty, the higher the reward. And if you, if you are unemployed and starving, no matter what the risk, if you can get you know, the equivalent of, of, of years salary for shooting some rhino and cutting its horn off, who's, are you gonna do it? Yes, um, but you know, if the, all that profit's taken out of there, what are you gonna do? You're gonna have to get a real job. Like and, you know, taking feeding the rhinos. Or, or feeding on, the on rhinos, farms. yeah. yeah. I, I think you wouldn't even have to anesthetize them. I think if you came up and sweet talked them, you, know, you could probably, you know, you, tell you them. Might, look, you might, you might, you might get an argument. Talk into their little rhino yeah. ears and say, "So here's your, here's your, here's your options, dude. You can <laughs> let me cut your horn off, or somebody's going to shoot you." Yeah. Here's uh, the horn, right there. Yeah, yeah. We've we've also I was talking about animals tonight, so let's talk <laughs> about insects as well. Uh, specifically honeybees. Now, interestingly enough, honeybees are an invasive species in the United States. Before the white man, before Europeans came, there were no honeybees in the continental, uh, you know, in, in the Americas. There were, Vinegar there were, bees only. There were yeah. bumblebees, other kind of bees, but no honeybees. But, the, you know, Europeans brought them with them and uh, now they are all over the place. And they are a very, very big part, important part of uh, pollinating a whole lot of crops, uh, including fruit crops uh, in mm -hmm. the Central Valley. I think you probably uh, uh, would know about that uh, in Dixon, right? Absolutely, absolutely. And and it, it kind of goes back to what uh, John was just talking about. The uh, As soon as you privatize and, and allow for uh, independent and, and private innovation and ownership of, of uh, um, an animal, really, or an entire species, um, you'll see propagation on a level that would not happen in nature. But I thought we were having bee colony collapse. Absolutely. And, and bees are a private industry, beekeeping. Yeah. So, so how, I mean, does that mean that the bee colony collapse has not resulted in the decimation of the population of bees? Well, apparently. And, and you know, one of the great things is that, uh, well, and you see it all around Dixon, especially this time of year, because there's sunflowers everywhere. Uh, and, and almonds and, and uh, walnuts, you'll see an entire pallets full of hives being shipped around from field to field and, and sitting alongside ditches. Uh, and, and they're out there doing work and creating millions of dollars of value uh, because there were enough farmers out there that were you know, willing to risk being stung and, 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 and uh, go after that profit motive. Uh, and. and find the best practices and that's exactly what they did you know if you allow for best practices to be developed through private ownership eventually you're going to have a more stable population than you would in the wild i mean in, in nature all kinds of things can go terribly wrong in, in a short manner of time so, so. didn't mean to interrupt no go ahead time. so it did a little study on this and this is actually the one of the best examples of uh, free markets operating because sometimes the beekeeper gets paid by the farmer and on and other times the farm the the beekeeper pays the farmer so if the the farmer needs crops uh, pollinated pollinated propagated yeah. I don't know what, the, what do you call it you're you're you've got a yeah pollinated pollinated so um, then the farmer will pay the beekeeper but if the the farmer doesn't the, uh, during certain seasons, bees make honey, and they sell the honey for money. Uh, then the the um, the
the beekeeper will move his bees somewhere where where there's the ability for the bees to get a lot of pollen and turn it into um, turn it into money. So, so the it, beekeeper will actually pay the farmer in that case. Yes, <clears throat> and so because they make money off the honey, and they, the, the, the like colony, negative, it sounds the like bee negative colony interest rate. collapse mm -hmm. is still uh, still exists, um, and they they haven't really figured it out despite a whole lot of studies. Uh, so it's very mysterious still, and it would be a huge issue if this thriving capitalist market wasn't out there and these people hadn't invented wonderful ways to counter it. Because what they do is they, they uh, scientifically uh, have hives, create, uh, feed royal jelly um, to certain bee, turn it into to a queen, and, and split the hive, and uh, create more hives when, when other hives die, when there's mites and all sorts of pests. Apparently bees are favorite targets for all sorts of mites and parasites and all the rest of that. But and there's, so, lot, there's lots, of, lots of workarounds. Yeah, and, and so they've managed workarounds so the bee population is actually higher because of all of this capitalism than before this uh, bee colony collapsed, which really did decimate something like 40% of the hives. Mm. Yeah. So but, capitalism but not, but, but had its the, bee, the bees are back. The bees yeah. are back because follow, of capitalism. Follow the, follow the money, honey. Yes. Exactly. Well, and one of the interesting things that you mentioned there was that it depends what, you know, what, do you, what does the, in the transaction, what's the most valuable? Is the honey more valuable? Or, or are the walnuts more valuable? The walnuts more valuable. Right. And so that's, that's awesome to see that, that social coordination that happens only in a free market where it just depends on what's more valuable. Or sometimes it's, it's a net, you know, like a, a, a net push. Everyone's benefiting from it. It comes down to free people making a free decision exactly. to uh, provide value to each other mm. at, a, at a price that's fair to each other. Mm. That's what capitalism, that's what uh, free markets are all about. You can't do that very efficiently in a top-down uh, top, uh, top government-run operation. Sure you can. Look at Venezuela. <laughs> Sorry, I exactly. just had to throw that out there as a... Little jab at I hear that cynicism. <laughs> I got I a little sarcasm here. on my tie here. Yeah. <laughs> well, thank you very much, uh, Devin, and good luck in your. You. How long is your term uh, as city councilman? Four years. And after this show, do you anticipate still getting reelected? <laughs> <laughs> Fingers crossed. Absolutely. Okay. If the people of Dixon will still have me. Okay. <laughs> and and you sound like you're enjoying the job. Absolutely. I, I love the debate. That's and what I what's, your, what's your next political objective? Or do you want to stay on the city council for, for, uh, for the duration? Well, it's my community. I was born and raised there. So I think for now, I'll stay focused there. Okay. <laughs> Thank you very much. You've been listening to watching the Libertarian Counterpoint. We'll be back again next week, same time, same place, on, uh, on your favorite television station. Thank you very much. Well, thank you, Richard.